Let's have a big round of applause for Dwight, please. <laughs> Dwight, uh, thanks for having me. Tonight I'm giving a short talk uh, and sharing why I think static websites have still got it. Uh, I'm Australian, hence the accent. I'm from this nice little city called the Gold Coast. I'm actually heading back there next Friday night. I'm quite excited about that, uh, escaping the, uh, the Dutch weather for a little while. Uh, speaking of the Netherlands, I've been here for six years now. Uh, originally I was a tech consultant. More recently I've been working on startups and side projects. Uh, one of those side projects is uh, an app called Knownly, and it's a, a way to host static websites uh, through Dropbox, and I'll share a bit more of that with you later. But the real aim of the talk tonight is to take a step back, look at why static websites uh, are great. Um, they've got many advantages uh, in a lot of different ways, uh, and I really believe that they offer some things that uh, make them preferable in a lot of ways to the more popular uh, blogging platforms, blogging software, site builders that you're probably familiar with. Uh, what I want to do tonight is, uh, is go through some of those advantages uh, and, and nice things about static sites. Uh, I then want to introduce the topic of static website generators. I'm not sure if a few of you worked with static website generators before. It's good to see. So we'll do a little bit, bit of a primer on, uh, on static website generators and what they do and why they're nice to work with. <clears throat> and then at the end, I'll do a little demo, uh, try and put all that together for you. So we'll look at the static, we'll take a quick static website, we'll throw it through a, a static site generator, and then we're going to deploy it with, uh, with Knownly really quickly. Uh, if you have any questions, or you want to clarify anything, like my name and how to spell it, uh, you can do that. I think it's really nice when we get an interactive presentation happening. Uh, so feel free to, uh, to shout out. Uh, if there's anything I can help you with. Otherwise, uh, just relax, enjoy. We're drinking beers tonight, which is good. Um, and yeah, what, what I really hope to do through the evening is put static websites and static website generators at front of mind for you. So the next time you go to build a product page, a documentation site, maybe a personal blog, a portfolio, or something like that, you're going to say, hey, I need to be doing this as a static website because it will save me a whole lot of time and it will keep things simple. So that's the plan. Let's start off with some of these nice uh, technical advantages of working with a static website. <clears throat> One of the first things is uh, scalability and availability. Uh, with a static website, as you guys probably know, being quite technical, uh, web server technology has been around for a long time. Uh, the web started off static back when Tim Berners-Lee was hacking away in uh, Switzerland in early 1990. And uh, that means that the web server technology we have today is really mature and it scales really well to serve uh, hundreds of thousands of requests and really deal with spikes in load quite well. Just a moderately uh, sized virtual machine in the cloud uh, or a uh, self-hosted um, web server with same configuration uh, with Apache or Nginx, something like that, is gonna be able to support uh, really high volumes uh, when it comes to serving static content. Uh, you can go beyond that as well. Uh, services like you know, S3, Heroku, make it quite easy to send static uh, content into the cloud uh, and, then uh, and then serve your, your site's visitors from there. So that also gives you the next level of, of sort of scalability and availability, not, not, with, not discounting the uh, occasional outage that you see in places like Amazon. Uh, but I think that going from a single uh, node uh, hosting a static website uh, of your own and self-hosting into the cloud is probably that next step up. And then you can go even further. Static websites are implicitly CDN ready. That means that you're going to be able to distribute your website through you know, edge locations that are, that are geographically distributed all around the world. Uh, highly available, highly scalable and highly performant, which is great. Uh, security is another nice element of static websites. They're so simple. Uh, there's no server-side processing happening, so you take away this whole class of code injection, SQL injection type attacks. Uh, you go uh, to a much leaner application architecture as well, so you've got fewer components that you need to patch uh, and maintain over time. Basically, you just need to keep your operating system up to date and, and keep your web server 
uh, patched and then you're good to go. Uh, when it comes to uh, yeah, maintainability as well, that's a, that's a good thing. Keeping it nice and simple to start with, obviously it will allow you to eventually go on perhaps to working with a more complex uh, web application framework, uh, bring the HTML code and the, the, the static elements that you might begin with later on into a, into a more complex application, it's nice and easy. Going in the other direction isn't always the case. Uh, and from a portability point of view as well, obviously it makes sense you can uh, really quickly move a, sta a static website from your own host, uh, your own server to the cloud, uh, back and forth with just a click of the button and it's nice and easy to replicate your, uh, your static website all over the place as well. So those are some of the sort of technical advantages I think that, uh, that mean we should keep static websites in mind, don't forget about them. It's, it's easy to uh, you know, spin up a Docker container and, and start de deploying uh, different application components and, and make things uh, you know, really enterprising. But for certain applications and certain uh, use cases, a static website I think is, uh, is just nice and simple and it will uh, save you a few headaches over time potentially. And that's what we want to do, keep things simple. All right, I want to look now at why uh, some of the, the blogs, blogging systems, uh, and the site builders that are really, comp uh, uh, really popular these days come with a lot of strings attached. Um, you've got self-hosted solutions, so you can install and, and host WordPress yourself. Um, a couple of experiences from my side, hosting WordPress as a blog, um, the developer workflow is kind of really weird. It's, you've got half of the, the application in code and configuration and then the other half is sort of deployed into the database. Uh, and so if you're wanting to you know, run sort of like uh, you know, good practice of maybe version controlling your, your application, uh, it gets really sticky trying to figure out what you've got running locally and what you've got running in the server and how you keep the two in sync. Um, they don't tell you that when you're reading the, the manuals about WordPress and you're thinking, oh, I've got one click install, it's super easy to get a blog running. Uh, over time, these things add up. Um, also with WordPress, I don't know if you've noticed, but it, it's been pretty susceptible to, to vulnerabilities. Uh, and that's just like the core uh, WordPress application. The number of, I was checking, so I think there's like a total of 170 vulnerabilities here over the last like 10 years, say. And that's like twice the number of, of vulnerabilities that Apache has had uh, as, a, as a web server software. Um, so just comparatively, it seems to me like WordPress <coughs> is uh, probably a little bit more susceptible and it powers like 25% of the web as well. I think there's some crazy statistic of how many websites are out there that are running WordPress. That's the core of, of the application. And then when you go and look at plugins as well, I think often the plugins are, can be na nasty as well. Uh, in terms of SQL injection and cross-site scripting and things like that. So you've got to be really careful when you're running WordPress and hosting it yourself or else you end up with a machine that's part of a botnet. Um, going on from self-hosting, you can pay and have a managed service, uh, but like, I don't understand how you pay 300 euro per year to, to basically unlock Google Analytics. So the only way that a managed service provider can can offer you WordPress and, and deliver the service and keep it under control uh, is by restricting it. So they take away all the themes and all of the plugins that you might want to run uh, and then they'll charge you a lot of money to, to have them back again in a managed sort of environment. So that's, uh, that's another kind of thing that you don't find out until later on after you've started investing time in WordPress and, and figuring out how to run it. Uh, lastly, the, 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 the hosting uh, the site builder platforms of like Weebly and Wix and Squarespace. That's what a lot of other people recommend to, to use if you want to get a website online quickly. Um, they're like nice and fast to get started with. They're simple to build something, but you do need to sort of figure out everything about the way that the admin works <laughs> and how it all comes together. So, and that time that you're spending doing that, I think you're just better off learning like HTML, CSS, JavaScript, the underlying technologies of the web, um, so that you can take those skills forward, uh, move them, move them on to your next project in a way where you're not locked into a specific platform. So we don't want that platform lock in. Um, so those are the three sort of areas that I just kind of came up with that I think where there's really strings attached to 
these site builders and, and anything that, that sort of promises a lot and then doesn't deliver so well over time. The next thing that is really a common topic around static websites and people will often say, I think there's a misconception, there's a lot of misconceptions that the things that you want to have a, uh, an interesting popular website, you need interactivity and engaging content and you need therefore <clears throat> like a web application and a database and all sorts of different bells and whistles built in. <coughs> Excuse me, but that's not really the case. Uh, there's so many different ways to get interactivity and fresh content into a static website. Uh, and I just want to run you through, you can see them right there. Um, when it's user generated content, uh, some great examples is like Discuss, a third party comment system where you can get a free account and you can just integrate a comment system into your website or your static blog uh, using a you know, JavaScript snippet uh, and a third party account. The same applies to uh, Discourse as well, which is a really nice uh, uh, forum type software, like a hosted uh, cloud-based forum uh, that you can again integrate with, with a couple of lines of JavaScript. Uh, Formsfree.io will give you HTML forms. So I'm really interested if you guys have sort of like examples or use cases where you, you need functionality in a, in a website, a static website, but you're thinking, oh, I'm going to need to build that or I need a... I need a full application, web application stack to do that. Um, grab me after the talk, I'd love to have a chat and see if we can figure out ways to, to build that into a static website because that's sort of one of my areas of interest. Um, community, again, all of the social networks will give you ways to integrate and hook in. And I think that uh, now in 2016 and, and, and more recently, people want to go to where the most interesting sort of best of breed software is. So like Slack, for instance, is a great place to run communities now. Um, so it's not necessarily about bringing everything in, in house or inside your own application. It's more about integrating it in smart ways that, that lets the user um, and your visitors actually engage in with technologies that they're familiar with and that they like to use. E-commerce and payments is the third thing that always comes up as well. People say, oh, I can't do a static website. I need payments. I, need, I, I want to be selling things. Uh, but that's pretty simply solved. Stripe Checkout is just a couple lines of JavaScript. You have your account with them uh, and then you're just integrating a, a widget into your static website so you can sell digital goods like on a transactional sort of uh, a way or you can have subscriptions set up as well. So if you're running little side businesses selling uh, Japanese candy or stroke waffles or something like that uh, as a service, as a subscription, um, then Stripe and Braintree will, uh, will let you do that as well. So I really believe that like nine times out of ten or for, for the majority of, of cases uh, when you need some sort of interactive fresh content uh, and, and functionality in a, in a website you can do it with a static uh, with a static website and really just mashing up third party services. So see how that goes for you and like I said have a chat with me afterwards if there's some uh, ideas that you have for, uh, for things that are needed. Uh, to move on. Uh, I want to go and now look and, and do this primer on uh, generators, static website generators. So you can think of static website generators as like a bread maker. You're going to throw all of these elements and artifacts uh, of a website uh, into a small piece of software that you're running locally on your machine uh, and that will put them through like a build and deployment pipeline and spit out the static uh, website that you, that you will then be able to deploy. It's pretty simple. Uh, the best things about them is that they're really fast and efficient uh, from a design and development workflow point of view. So they do all the great things that as developers we like to have uh, and they support you in a lot of the similar ways if you're familiar with Django or Ruby on Rails as, a, as an application framework. A lot of the fun development time functionality and features in those web application frameworks uh, have sort of been brought across into the static world through static website generators and I'll talk about some of those features in a moment. The other thing that they do really well is uh, provide support for fast and focused content authoring, content creation. Um, talk about how that works as well. So yeah, in principle they're really just offering a uh, fast and an easier way to, to build a, a website out. Uh, this is sort of the conceptual diagram of how, how it works. Like I said, you're, you're taking content uh, with templates and then all of your other static assets, putting it through a local development uh, dev server uh, that's running on your local machine and then emitting a static website. 
Uh, some of the features that you get are the templating. So you'll be using a templating engine like, or sorry, a templating language like Ginger or Liquid, uh, which gives you tags, HTML tags or HTML-like tags that save you time uh, and allow you to do a lot of uh, neat things like making your source code, your, your website source modular and really componentized. So if you've got standard headers and footers, then it's going to bring those in and uh, when the site is generated, you only need one copy of the, the code or one, one specific uh, fragment that is then replicated across all of the uh, pages in your site. Yeah, you've got a question. What, what, what do you use for that, for, uh, for uh, compiling the liquid? Yeah, so they generally they're baked in. So if you're using uh, uh, one of the ones that I like, so I'll demonstrate with Cactus, which is a Python-based site generator. And so their, their templating language is uh, the Django templating language. Uh, and that's basically, in the local development server, it's a Python process. So you'll start up the process and then it puts in there and it's constantly running a pipeline uh, over that. So it's a little bit equivalent to uh, using gulp and a watch command where it detects a change to the file system that will then regenerate the website and you go from there. So depending on the on the static site generator that you pick, you'll get a different uh, you'll get a different uh, templating language. I know Jekyll is using Liquid, uh, and that's probably the most common uh, static website generator out there at the moment. Uh, so yeah, you get modular mod modularity, which is awesome. So your development experience is very dry. You're not repeating yourself constantly uh, with the HTML source code. Uh, tags for common data types and things like that. Uh, the local development server that I just mentioned is really helpful uh, a lot of, uh, in a lot of the similar ways to when you're working with Rails or Django. Uh, you've, like I said, the, the server, the local development server will watch the file system. So when you're making changes to your CSS, uh, it's going to trigger the regeneration of your website. And then it will also have things like uh, a live reload capability built in. So you make a change to your source, you'll tab into your browser, and it's already refreshed with your change. Uh, so it speeds things up a whole lot. It's, it's really quite nice. Um, it lets you work offline as well. That's a great thing. If you're traveling a lot, you're often on planes. Uh, having that local development environment um, is awesome. And it really encourages people to do the right thing. I probably don't need to preach too much to you guys about um, developing testing locally before you deploy to your servers and production environments, but like I said, with like WordPress, in a lot of cases, you're kind of forced to. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's another good reason with the, the development servers. And then just to talk a little bit more about that uh, build and deploy pipeline, you're able to do things like pre-processing, so your CSS and, and, and SAS is well supported. Uh, you can use uh, JavaScript transpilation, uh, with like VS6 to 5, VS6 to 5. Um, coffee script and things like that as well. There's a lot of plug-in support in these uh, static site generators as well so that you can uh, yeah, basically do whatever you need and then really automate it, automate the hell out of it, which is, uh, which is good. Uh, deployments as well, a couple of them go as far as automating the deployment. Cactus, if you have an S3 account uh, and you're willing to store your, your tokens in a keychain uh, on OSX for instance, uh, you can automate the deployment to S3, which is which is quite cool. Uh, and then in my case, with my my project Gnomely, you're basically just telling the, the you're just configuring the generator to emit the files to Dropbox, and then with Gnomely and Dropbox, and Dropbox does the syncing to the cloud, your website's automatically deployed. And I'll show you that in a little while. So yeah, that was the the sort of build development workflow, design development workflow for uh, the static website generators. The other cool thing is the writing or the actual content creation. So you, you're usually working with something like Markdown um, or restructured text. So you're taking, uh, if you're using, like if you're working on blog posts um, or like a portfolio type website, you'll typically have some front matter, which are like uh, key value pairs uh, at the top of a file that might give you your name and the date if you're authoring an article. And then you'll drop into like Markdown for content and the generator does all of the heavy lifting to convert that into HTML. Uh, that's great because it allows you to focus on the writing. You're not needing to worry about all of the syntax of HTML and, and things like that. You're really just able to, to crank out the, uh, the content. So that's good for, for blogging and uh, content creation as well. 
uh, when it comes to blogging, as I, I don't know if I already mentioned it, maybe it's not entirely clear. Um, you get a lot of, lot of neat things for free with blogs as well. So all of the navigation, the chronological navigation, the archive pages and things like that are really easy to generate with a static website generator. RSS feeds as well are produced and stuff like that. I don't know, does anybody still use RSS? One or two people. Man, I used to love it so much and it just kind of died. Oh, anyway, um, so that's pretty much it, static website generators. So now you've sort of seen static websites are cool and I think they still need to, be, you know, they still have a really important place. Uh, static website generators, they're not exactly new. I think the, the first ones were, were being built like Jekyll 2008 or something, but I think in the last couple of years with GitHub pages uh, and a couple of other services uh, becoming pro quite popular. Uh, Static website generators are something that you guys should know about and hopefully are thinking about now to, to work with in future. So who's ready for a demo? Yes. Do you want to see some live coding time? Okay, I really don't want to do any live coding. All right. So what I'm going to do to uh, kick off is, yeah, I'll grab a copy of a, like a, a bootstrap project for Cactus. I won't install Cactus and all these kind of things. So I've got Cactus. I'll show you the GitHub page for Cactus. Uh, I've got it links at the end of my uh, presentation as well, which you'll be able to download or I'll send them out. We so, don't see them. You don't see, oh yeah, I need to. I'm not mirroring. Thank you. I wonder if anyone, everyone else is just going to sit around and. I was going to do the demo for myself. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, so, so it's actually built by a nice local guy, uh, Cone. I don't know if any of you know him. Um, he's now the founder of a, of a software company called Framer. Um, but in any case, he built Cactus a few years back. Uh, I've been using it for a while. I quite like it because uh, I find Jekyll messes, it sort of, me Jekyll puts a lot of the outputted content in line in the same directory structure as the, the templates. And I think Cactus is a little bit more sane in that it's, a, it's emitting to like a dot .build directory. So you, when you're looking at, at, the, um, at your directory structure, which you'll see in a minute, it's a little bit nicer. So we're starting with Cactus. And uh, let me see. So I've basically got Cactus available through a virtual environment here. It, are there Python developers in the room or familiarity with Python? Just, so, awesome. just, just one. <laughs> no big deal. Basically, I've just installed uh, Cactus, the, the software that's already running. So I can do like. Uh, uh, okay, so, so Cactus is running and doing something. I'm going to uh, clone this seed project that I have. Uh, where is it? Yeah. Okay. Okay, and then move that across as well. So I've just grabbed this seed project and it I don't think I can make that directory structure any bigger. Uh, but basically if you look at it you've got the pages, so this is sort of the content of the website. And you'll see two things there. There's generally the the standard sort of stuff like an index page and a robots, robots file. Now if we take a look at the robots file, you'll start to see that this is some Django templating uh, tags in here. So the generator is going to take that and produce a full robots.txt file for you uh, at the end. Uh, the sitemap gets generated as well uh, with some looping uh, constructs and so on. And then under here there's some posts. So there's a couple of posts in here and you can demonstrate the front matter uh, and then the markdown as well that sits in the middle here. So this is just a, uh, an open GitHub repository. I needed to fork the original one because the cactus has moved forward a little bit but this uh, this template blog hasn't been maintained, so I've just got a fork of that that I upgraded last night to work with Cactus 3, which is the latest version. So if I run Cactus now, this is the development server. Uh, so that's running here. 
No. <coughs> uh, yeah. Okay, so that's the blog. Um, yeah, my motivational quotes. Uh, <laughs> this is the blog, and then, like you can see, it sort of works like a blog, which is good. And then, <laughs> we're going to make some changes. So let's go look at the template. So there's like a base template here, and it's kind of boring to change the, the title. But hey, we'll do it. I'll copy it. So that's just your header, or the, the, sorry, the HTML head section on the index page. So let's go back and take a look. So this index page has got this funky hellos statement at the top. Let's just replace that. Okay, and then, sorry, I've got to keep. And then, so the live reload's already reloaded that. So you get the idea that this makes developing a, a, you know, nice little websites, blogs, portfolio sites, company pages are really, really simple. And then you can go further with, um, you know, like SaaS and so on. So really elegant designs. Um, you can get to, um, and basically all the power that you, that you need from a web development point of view is right there with the static website. So let's see if we can like, get this live now, just for the hell of it. Um, so Knownly, which is this guy here, this is the, uh, something I've been working on in my spare time when I'm not working for the man. Um, <laughs> yeah, the idea is that you can host these uh, static websites uh, using Dropbox. So I'm trying to target a little bit more, like a little bit less technical folks who aren't necessarily uh, comfortable with Git uh, and are wanting to do more of like learning and getting started with web development. So this lets you get going with uh, Dropbox. So all you need to do is really kind of approve knownly to access, uh, sorry, approve, yeah, approve knownly to access your Dropbox. And we just take access to an application folder. So it's from a security point of view, we only ever get to access um, a new folder that's created uh, where we put your websites and then the rest of your Dropbox uh, content is not accessible to Nonely. I'm not gonna go through the, the auth. It's just one more click and then you choose a free plan and, and you're in and you land on a site like, let's go get it. That's it. Yeah, so these are all a bunch of different static sites that I've got uh, running. And then I just want to create a new one. Let's just call it the circus. And then that's created a folder in my Dropbox. I can see it here. Um, so if I now, well, let's take a look at what just happened. Uh, So I've got a, basically a very low-key template now already uh, in my uh, finder. Uh, if you don't, if just to show, it's in uh, under my Dropbox apps, only.net. So that's the actual file. I could go in and change that, but I'm just going to copy this across now. So. Okay, I can see my Dropbox is syncing here. So at the moment, like I just copied that on my local machine from the build directory of the static site generator into Dropbox. Luckily, the Wi-Fi seems to be working. And so now my website that I just built and started is live. Um, and yeah, nice and fast. So that's how Knownly works. Um, and that's how a static website generator works. And that's why uh, I think static websites have still got it. Any questions or are uh, we going to dive into anything? Yeah, we can start with you, you were first. Um, the name names, um, it's, it's only on the only dot net. Um, this one is, yeah. 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 I, I'm guessing like, you wouldn't be able to do that um, with your own. So you wouldn't be able to do that in that amount of time unless your DNS TTL is really short. 
uh, but basically it's set up so that you can uh, grab a domain that you own and with a CNAME record hook that across to the Knownly service. So, I mean, I've got like all of those, uh, a lot of those websites in, in, in the list and there's some cool ones out there already that some of my, some customers have got like, um, where is it, the, the guys who run Mood. So this is uh, hosted on Knownly and it's with a custom domain. Uh, and it's got like an epic HTML sort of video feed in here, uh, newsletter sign up forms. This was for, this is some Italian guys who made some crazy glasses with like Lego connectors on them. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> that's cool. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, you can use a, you can use a custom domain. Um, that's where I'm trying to figure out the pricing and, and how that can be part of a freemium sort of model for, for this side project. Um, you, I've got one at the back, but I think you had a question as well, maybe? Yeah? Yeah, so I'm just curious what's added, because you can already host static websites with Dropbox. Yeah. You just don't get a really nice looking URL, so what's... The, yeah, so the, the, the comparison to, to uh, GitHub pages, or do you, sorry, you meant Dropbox. Dropbox. Yeah, so with Dropbox you don't have, uh, yeah, the URLs are kind of hard to work with. Yeah. There's no, um, and there's, as far as I know, there, it would be, would be really hard and manual to configure those all up because they're all unique URLs. You can't share out like a, just a path that says this is my, um, this is my uh, index page for instance. Uh, Dropbox will, will serve that with a, with a MIME type that I'm pretty sure the browser is not going to render that as a, as a standard web page. It'll offer you to download that, that HTML file. I actually yeah. can make a Yeah? yeah. Uh, uh, I'll, I might sync up with you then and, and see how you do that because I'd be interested to know. I just copied it there, nothing else. Yeah? Okay. Cool. Right, yeah, so my you URLs. Yeah, the, U the URLs, I think. But yeah, no, that's and that, that is possible. Um, but yeah, I think also with this, you, you you can connect a little bit easier with the with the static site generator as well. So that's one of the other things I'm trying to do is make it uh, seamless for uh, for people getting started. Can you put JavaScript there? JavaScript for sure. Yeah, yeah. Like this page is full of JavaScript. I've got a client based on. It's client based JavaScript. Yeah, there's no server side processing. Um, yeah, but by React, yes. Yeah, yeah, so. so, so. This is a, I give you one, I, I facilitate startup weekends. Uh, and so this is, an, this is like really old and cr kind of crappy Angular application, but it will show you what you can do. So this is basically an Angular app that is fetching data from an open API, uh, and that's all Angular. So we're just pulling in, yeah, like, and then uh, like an ng repeat to, to populate that table. So you can do some pretty nice client-side JavaScript stuff as well. Uh, and that's where the mashups come in. So if you want to use third-party services, uh, then Angular and React are, are great. But yeah, no server-side JavaScript at the moment. Oh, yeah. uh, there was one at the back. Sorry, man, I, I kind of... Right, so besides knowing it would be a really good approach for deploying your stuff to production, what other good option is there out there? Like, what is a common practice to have good practice to deploy your stuff to your favorite? Website yeah. So, what what's your favorite host? I I haven't done that like in ten years. So. Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, like S three is a great alternative for more technical folks. So. And how do you put it in S three? So with S three, uh, if you're using a, a cactus, then it's all baked in. You just type cactus deploy, mm. and then the first time it will ask you for your Amazon secret and token or key or whatever they're called. I can't remember. And then they'll put those into your keychain. And then from there onwards, any time that you, you've opened your keychain, it will automatically deploy to S3, which is pretty sweet uh, and, and simple. Um, Heroku, same sort of deal. The Heroku tool belt that you run from your command line, uh, they have options to host static websites as well. Uh, yeah, it just takes away the need to, I mean, nobody, I hope nobody really feels like you need to FTP static content to a, to a server anymore. Yeah. You don't need to anymore. Uh, <laughs> and by the way, this uh, uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. That we use, does it go to uh, Dropbox every for every request? No, not every requ request. Uh, I've got 
some caching happening on the web okay. server with Lua. Yeah, I'm using Lua to, to do some smart caching. I looked at um, Varnish and things like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, there's some, there's some Lua happening on my web server. And yeah, I've got this epic kind of product backlog where I want to implement uh, an integration with a CDN. So depending on your use case and, and how performance is critical to your website, you might be able to tick on a on a on a CDN. I think the Dropbox doesn't like you just putting really like websites that have some moderate traffic on. Uh, yeah, you will get rate limited. So that's why I've been implemented the caching uh, on on our Nomely web servers, and I'm in the process of. Uh, distributing some Nomely uh, servers around the, the world as well in different data centers. Uh, because basically, yeah, at the moment, there's two hops. So if I'm really honest, um, the performance benefits that you get from a static website are in some way kind of taken away by the fact you need to go through the Nomely service as a middleman right now. It's a, it's a, it's a middleware layer in the middle. Um, <coughs> but it's still pretty fast, like you saw that loaded you know, in moderate speed. So, yeah, in the pipeline, CDNs, smart caching as well, so that we don't have to hit the Dropbox uh, API each time. Yeah. Any other questions? Otherwise, I'll... Uh, I have a question. Oh, yeah. What's about CDNs? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. We'll have a chat afterwards, maybe. <laughs> Thanks very much, guys. Yeah. Okay, lovely. So that's one demo down, one demo up. <laughs> we'll find out how the last one's going to go after the break. We're going to take a 10 minute break. So you can take a piss, get a beer, whatever you want to do. And we'll come back here with the guys from Specto Labs.